just turn it on. I'm just rewriting what the last sure. slide is. Uh. Do you want me to introduce you or wait until you're done? No, sure, you can. Okay. So we're happy to continue with Isabel Garcia Garcia talking about particle physics, gravity, and symmetries. Okay, so I'm going to uh, take off from where we ended yesterday, which was introducing solutions to the strong CP problem that are based on restoring parity symmetry. So we left off yesterday. Uh, Introducing these solutions, uh, so the gauge group, as I mentioned, has to be extended to include an additional SU2 factor that typically goes by the name of SU2 rate. And then the matter content also uh, needs to be effectively doubled uh, as well for leptons and also for the Higgs. Uh, so here I'm just going to remind you of the various, uh, very briefly, uh, charge assignments. So quarks transforming and the, the fundamental of SU3, including sort of these mirror quarks. Uh, the charges for the standard model are the usual, except everything is, of course, a singlet under SU2 rate. And then sort of this prime, if you want, mirror sector has basically identical gauge charges, except we extend sort of SU2 uh, and SU rate charge assignments. This is the same. And then one half. Uh, so we left up here, and I was telling you that it is possible with this field content and this gauge structure, it's possible to define what we can call a generalized version of parity that sort of combines the action of ordinary parity with sort of an internal symmetry that exchanges the fields of the unprime and unprime sectors, okay? So uh, exchange So effectively this means uh, you know, the gauge bosons in the SU2 left sector get exchanged with SU2 right. Similarly for, you know, the quarks. So they not only transform at their party in the sense that left-handed ball fermions are switched with right-handed guys, but they also get uh, exchanged with their, their prime counterparts. Uh, similarly for the Higgs. And then crucially, I think this is where we end yesterday, uh, since SU3 and the U1 factors are not uh, duplicated in this construction, they don't need to be, uh, these guys just transform as usual under parity, under this, uh, you know, this, generalized, uh, this generalized version of parity. Okay, so uh, at three level, this allows us to set the value of theta bar to zero. Uh, and we'll see, so let me explain, let me explain why. So this generalized parity, I'm gonna drop the generalized uh, as we go along because you know, with this field content, this is as good the definition of parity as, as anything else. Uh, so yeah, so we can, if we impose that this uh, version of parity is exact, this means, in particular, that so the the theta term, since we said earlier that um, so the SU3 factor transforms as usual under parity, this whole thing goes to minus itself, and they're also generalized parity. So this cannot be there, okay? So theta bar theta has to be zero um, by by parity, and then. 
the other piece we need to worry about is the the quark mass sector. And let me let me just write down what happens in the app sector. So in these models we have the same thing we had uh, for the standard model. So Higgs, UJ, <clears throat> and I'm gonna write it to make my life easy. So we're gonna have masses for both the standard model and sectors that I can write like this. Uh, dagger, and everything is plus complex conjugate. And so in general, there will be some other matrix, some other Yukawa matrix, why you prime this for the, for the, for the masses of, of this new sector. So generalized parity now exchanges these guys with these guys, which is the same as saying that if we want this symmetry to be exact, yu prime and yu actually have to be the same. And this is also true for the, the down quark, the down quark sector, okay? So these matrices can actually be independent of each other, they have to be identical. Um, so now uh, the second contribution to theta bar, so now theta is zero, so theta bar will be only coming from, you know, the complex structure of the, of the quark mass matrix. In this case, so this guy is also given by the argument of the determinant of the overall mass matrix, if you want. I'm gonna write it as mu md. Um, but now uh, that structure is somewhat, uh, somewhat more extended, okay? Uh, so we can write down this. Yeah, we can write, uh, I'm running out of space. So in particular, so we could think of the mass matrix in the up core sector. Uh, as a six by six matrix now, rather than three by three, where we have sort of two blocks here that are, you know, zero, and then we can write it sort of something like this. And I'm allowing for the webs uh, in the two Higgses to be different. We'll come back to this in a minute. So you can write the mass matrix uh, in, in this form, and then what you end up with here is argument of the determinant of uh, y u transpose y prime u star, and the same thing uh, for the for the Dunkor sector. However, again, like if parity is a good symmetry and y prime is actually the same as uh, sorry, yeah, y prime is the same as y, then this could be this combination uh, of the of the Yukawa matrix, which is a Hermitian combination. Okay. So the eigenvalues of a Hermitian matrix are all real, therefore the argument of the determinant of this guy is exactly zero. So this guy is also zero, okay? So at three level, uh, this these, uh, extended version of parity allows us to, to completely set theta bar to, to zero. Obviously parity cannot be an exact symmetry in our world, uh, we haven't seen you know, six generations of quarks and leptons. We haven't seen an additional copy of the of the W and the W and C bosons. So parity needs to be broken uh, at some at some level. Uh, we're going to discuss how that can happen now, and whether that breaking of parity that we need in order to reconcile our field content with, you know, experimental observations can still remain consistent with theta bar being tiny beyond three levels. So remember, you know, we were discussing yesterday the experimental bound of theta bar is ten to the minus ten. 10 to the minus 10 is a very small number, so even if theta bar was generated at one loops, two loops, in some cases, maybe even more so, uh, you know, that can still be a problem for, for certain models, right? So, yeah, so parity must be broken. Such that the Higgs bev in this mirror sector is much bigger than the, the electroweak scale uh, in the standard model, so that all of this additional field content is much heavier, okay? So for example, uh, we can sort of parameter that in terms of a soft breaking term in the, in the scalar potential for the various fixes. So I'm just gonna write down basically all the terms in the, in the potential at dimension four that would be uh, consistent with, with generalized parity, except for a soft breaking term. So we have a quadratic term 
of this form. So I'm basically just enlarging the standard model, basically Higgs potential, to make it uh, now p symmetric. Uh, we can also have a quartic that I'm going to write like this. And then I'm going to add also a second quartic. We'll discuss a little bit more about this structure in a second. Uh, so this could be you know, all the terms up to dimension four that I can write down that are consistent with, they are symmetric under the exchange of h and h prime. Uh, in order to parameterize the breaking of parity that we need, we can sort of add a sort of breaking of this symmetry uh, by just you know, adding a term like this. So under exchange of h and h prime, this, this term is you know, change the sign. Uh, therefore, therefore, it breaks parity. There is something you can see already uh, at the level of this, at the level of this potential, that is that we want to have, uh, you know, the standard model Higgs to get a vacuum expectation value that is much smaller than the vacuum expectation value of this guy. This requires uh, already at three level some amount of fine tuning between this, you know, this uh, the coefficient of this operator and the coefficient of this operator. Okay, uh, and if you and it turns out like this. You know, this amount of fine tuning that I'm going to call delta is effectively quantitatively given by the ratio of the two VEPs uh, squared in the for the two Higgses. Okay, uh, and we need this number to be certainly uh, much smaller than one. How is, how much is smaller than one will be a measure of how successful the solutions to the strong CP problem are. Obviously, if this ratio has to be much smaller than 10 to the minus 10, uh, you know what we've done is sort of we sort of traded one tiny number uh, in one sector to like a fine tuning in the scalar potential of another theory that is of the same magnitude, right? So that wouldn't, in my opinion, that wouldn't amount to a lot of progress. Uh, so ideally, we want this to be not just a smaller, not, not just bigger than 10 to the minus 10, but ideally a lot bigger, right? So that the theory is not as fine tuned as the theory that we that we started with. Uh, and we'll see, we'll see whether to what extent that is possible. Uh, so let me just, so honest, an honest solution requires that that I is certainly bigger than, than 10 to minus 10, and as I said, ideally, you know, quite a bit, quite a bit bigger than this. So let us discuss how small can this uh, this new uh, symmetry breaking scale be prime. How, how small can this be based on uh, the experimental constraints that uh, we have? And there are basically like two possibilities. There are two possibilities, uh, and I the two possibilities uh, are related to something that I didn't tell you here. But so let me go back to the. To the mass matrix uh, of the of the quark sector in this series, uh, it turns out that because the U1 chart assignments of these fields are identical, there is in fact another source of mass for the fermions that I can write in these models that is consistent with generalized parity, uh, and that is that maybe I'll just write it here. Sorry, I can also write down what I'm going to call a vector-like mass matrix, okay, that couples the two, uh, sorry, what am I doing? Yeah, uh, U1 prime. Yeah, well, that couples the, the two SU2 uh, singlets, okay? This is symmetric under generalized parity. So this preserves, provided these, these new guys are uh, Hermitian matrices. Okay, but otherwise, you know, other than being Hermitian, this is a general sort of source of fermion masses that these theories can have, and in general will have. So there are now two options uh, to, that will allow us to see, you know, how, how a small V prime can be. One option is, well, maybe the entries of these guys are, are very tiny. Notice that this is what we call a vector like mass, which is, you know, technically natural to take a small or large. Uh, it doesn't actually involve the fine tuning. Uh, so there's, if the entries in these matrices are much smaller, the typical size is much smaller than the scales B and B prime, 
then to leave in order that we can sort of like forget about these guys. Uh, and then the lightest new particle in these models would be uh, a, a color particle. Uh, and it would be, in particular, sort of the mirror partner of the up core sector. Okay, So if we can completely neglect this, all the fermions in this mirror sector are just a copy of the, of the fermions in the standard model, except that they are heavier by a factor of B prime over V. So uh, yeah, you have a couple of, so as you know, a map is sort of like 10 to the minus 5 times V. So this could be something 10 to the minus 5 times V prime. Now, it turns out that bounds on, on additional color particles from you know, the ALAS and CMX experiments set a very stringent bound okay, on this possibility. And being generous, uh, this has to be, at the very least, above 1 TV. Okay, this would mean that the parity breaking scale uh, in these models would have to be no less than 10 to the 8 GeV. Okay, and this would mean a level of fine tuning in the, in the scalar sectors of these models of order 10 to the minus 12. Okay, so bad news. So for a long time, uh, you know, people thought about these parity solutions a little bit sort of like in this, in this vein, and I think this is also why perhaps, you know, quite correctly, they weren't sort of like taking very seriously uh, solutions to this one CP problem, but there is actually another possibility that has uh, certain, um, you know, positives, some positive uh, features to it, which is we can actually also take the limit where this, this new source of mass for the fermions is actually much bigger than both V and V prime. Okay, what this means, uh, one of the implications of this is that all of the light fermions, so all the fermions that we have uh, in the standard model are realized via what sometimes goes by the name of a CISO mechanism for fermion masses. You may have heard that term in particular in connection with, with neutrino masses, but it can be, it can be more general uh, and it can be realized more generally in this, in this context. So the idea here is that, you know, we have, this, we have these new guys. So these guys, to, to lead in order, uh, you know, these SG2 singlets uh, comprise their own sort of Dirac fermion that is, you know, appears at some much higher mass scale. So just to, if we only care about what happens, you know, at low energies, we can integrate out these, these new fermions at three level. And this generates for us a, a dimension five operator, okay, involving only the, the, the various SU2 fermion doublets, which, you know, up to order one coefficient, I'm not gonna write down, has this, has this matrix structure. MU to the minus one. Okay. So this is now a dimension five operator. When uh, the Higgs in both the standard model and the prime sectors get a vacuum expectation value, so after a spontaneous symmetry breaking, what we ha what we get is I'm going to write it schematically. So what we get is v prime v, and then something like u u prime plus Hermitian conjugate. Okay, so in this in this sort of implementation of of a standard model quark masses, the sort of right-handed partners of the standard model fermions actually are live in this as you to write. Uh, in this edge to write are uh, multiplied, okay? And what you see here is that, you know, the effective Yukawa coupling for the, in particular for the up quark in these models, would be sort of this, this combination of the, of, the, of the original parameters, okay? This has one interesting feature that I will mention just in passing, which is that, uh, so, the typical scale of these vector-like masses, uh, as we said here, has you know, for this to be realized, has to be bigger than V and V prime. So 
V prime over B is already sort of like a small, it's a small ratio. It could be as small as 10 to the minus 2 without maintaining perturbativity. Uh, so that gives you a factor of 10 to the minus 2. And then in order to get something as small as 10 to the minus 5, you can live with a Yukawa coupling, which is you know, somewhere between like 0.1 and 10 to the minus 2. And you get you know, a 10 to the minus 5 number out of this. So just like with neutrino masses, uh, this type of like CISO implementation of Fermi masses allows you to also maybe not fully solve, but certainly ameliorate uh, the flavor problem of the standard model of like explaining, you know, why are certain Yukawa couplings so small relative to others. Here, you know, there's, there's a ratio of scales that is naturally small in these models that, you know, gains you a couple of orders of magnitude perhaps. And then the fact that you're squaring the fundamental Yukawas also helps you not having to input uh, really tiny numbers in the, in the Fermi spectrum, okay? So that is kind of like an accidental happy accident uh, that happens in these models. But uh, the bottom line is that now uh, these guys are super heavy, okay? So the lightest new particles in this model are no longer uh, color charged particles. Uh, those are, you know, way above, uh, way above the scale V prime. In this model, in fact, uh, let me actually sort of write, write this down properly. So at very low energies, we just have uh, the standard model. So all the way from massless to to the scale of a spontaneous symmetry breaking. At some very high scale, we have these bunches of you know, vector-like quarks, uh, vector-like quarks, but also leptons, et cetera. And then at some intermediate scale V prime, uh, we will have in particular the, the W prime and C prime copies of the, of the standard model gauge boson. So in fact, now uh, the lightest new particles are not color particles, they are this new electroweak, uh, electroweak uh, copies of the, of the W and C resonances. So the prediction for this, so the masses of these particles are basically just, in these models, a copy of the standard model, except heavier by a factor of V on V prime, and current bounds on, on resonances like this that couple to the standard model fermions, just like the Ws and Cs of the standard model do, which is what happens in, this, in these cases sets an upper bound on the mass of these guys, which is a further uh, 60 AB, okay? Which means a parity break in the scale of further, you know, around 18 TeV and puts uh, the fine tuning in these models to something along the lines of like 10 to the minus three, okay? So that is obviously a lot better than 10 to the minus 12. It's also a lot better than 10 to the minus 10. Uh, it's not order one, but you know, it is a one in a thousand accident that solves the strong CP problem. And it also has some other sort of interesting uh, accidental features as far as the, the flavor sector is concerned. So that's where these solutions stand at the moment. This is the best you can possibly do. Uh, and, um, and yeah, and future, so future measurements uh, in particular. So this is in many ways, uh, a non-irreducible signature of these models, okay? So future bounds on the mass of, um, you know, extra C prime or W prime resonances um, will, you know, if this, if this bound increases, uh, this, is, this is something that, you know, you cannot get out of in these models. Uh, so these are, in some sense, like the prime, you know, experimental signatures uh, that, this, that these models have. Um, but, you know, you can, I think it's fair to say that, you know, to, to, to a large extent, these remain uh, successful solutions to, to the strong CP. Yes? Uh, sorry, maybe I missed this, but where did you say this estimate of, of about 6 TeV? 6 TeV? Yeah. Oh, this is just bounced from LHC, like Atlas. So W prime and C prime will decay to two electrons, two pions. Okay. So, so precisely because now, so precisely because of this, uh, you know, the right-handed partners, like the right-handed parts of the standard model fermions live in these SU2 right doublets. They therefore inherit their couplings. So the, the right-handed fermion currents inherit their couplings to the W prime and C prime. So basically, they couple identically to the W prime and C prime as they do to the W and the Z. So, and this is very constrained, like, you know, C prime to two pions is like very constrained at the moment. Like, that's the, that's the bound. Um, we did, uh, you know, I spent a little bit of time yesterday kind of uh, criticizing the axion because of how sensitive it was to, in particular, 
breaking of the PQ symmetry due to higher dimensional operators. So we are going to estimate you know, how Planck suppressed higher dimensional operators affect the symmetries. But before I do that, uh, let me just briefly comment what happens in these models beyond three level. OK, so at three level, theta bar is 0. Uh, what happens with, with additional corrections to theta bar? Do they ruin this problem, uh, or, or are we still in good shape? So let me mention that first. So there are, um, so this is not a somewhat, this is not sort of like a model independent statement you can make about what is the predicted size of, of theta bar in these models. It depends a little bit on like, you know, various things that you can play around with. If the only source of parity breaking in these models was, you know, a soft term in the scalar potential like this, then the contribution to theta bar radiatively would be even smaller than it is in the standard model, okay? And that is, uh, of order 10 to the minus 19. Okay, so that's an observable small in any sort of realistic future uh, measurement. Uh, and that will also be true, for example, if this, if this soft breaking is realized spontaneously in a way that only violates parity, uh, but not CP. However, there is another source, sorry, okay, no questions. Uh, there's another source of uh, breaking of, potential breaking of parity and CP which is uh, then that these matrices that have to be Hermitian by parity, uh, they could have a non-Hermitian non -Hermitian part as well, okay? That would be a sort of breaking of parity. Uh, so if at some level these matrices are actually not completely Hermitian, there are some additional dynamics that, uh, you know, gives them some anti-Hermitian parts, this amounts to a sort of breaking of both uh, this generalized parity, but also CP, okay? Uh, an important consequence of this is that at one loop, this will lead to contributions uh, to the electric dipole moment of the neutron. So for example, I'm just gonna do the diagram, um, so the diagram that corresponds to the electric dipole moment of say, you know, the down type quark, the same is true for up quark. Um, and there's also you know, similar diagrams where what propagates here are C and C primes. Okay, so if parity was an exact symmetry, um, you know, diagrams involving you know, the Higgs and the heavy Higgs will cancel. Diagrams involving the C and the heavy C will cancel. Uh, when these guys have different masses, there is, you know, there is a leftover, uh, there's a leftover piece uh, in the sum. Um, and when everything is done and dusted, what that looks like, so the contribution to basically, I'm gonna write it down, this is actually also true for not just the down quark, but you know, basically all of the light standard model fermions, including the charged leptons, in a second. So basically the prediction is relative to the electric charge, the unit electric charge, uh, this is given by, can be written in this way. So the factor, and then the typical mass of, so it turns out that these diagrams are actually dominated by heavy fermions running, running inside the loop. This could be, you know, the number of such species, which, you know, you can think of order one. This is the overall electric charge of those guys, also order one. Uh, but then this is suppressed by the mass of the light fermion, uh, over the, the overall mass of these heavy fermions, which is this, you know, vector-like, heavy vector-like mass. And this is all multiplied by, schematically, the sort of, you know, the overall size of, of the non-hermeticity uh, of these vector-like masses, okay? So let's say this is order one, uh, be maximally pessimistic. You know, what numbers do we get uh, for, for say, um, you know, the down quark, uh, et cetera. So for example, for the down quark, and you know, a similar, because yeah, a similar, and a similar, you know, number applies therefore for the, for the EDM of the neutron. 
uh, if I, so I'm gonna normalize this, the overall value of this spectral like mass to something which is like twice V prime. Uh, we get something like this, okay? Now, if you remember from my uh, previous lecture, the current experimental constraint on the neutron EDM is 10 to the minus 26 E times centimeter. So this is only two orders of magnitude below uh, the current experimental bound. Now, I could increase, you know, this vector-like mass could be, you know, a factor of 10 bigger, in which case this would be, you know, two orders of magnitude smaller. But, you know, the point stands that generically you do expect contributions to the, to the neutron EDM in this series, which are actually not that far away from what the current experimental bound is. And over the next, you know, five to 10 years, it is expected that the bound on, on theta bar is going to improve by somewhere between like four and five uh, orders of magnitude. So those, those precision experiments trying to look for, for neutron EDMs are certainly something to watch uh, as far as, as far as, you know, physics we understand the model is concerned. Uh, there's also, uh, this estimate actually applies not just to uh, the quark sector, this is also true for leptons, uh, in particular the electron. So let me put in, so for the electron we get sort of a similar estimate. Uh, so let me, now I need to cheat a little bit because, so I'm going to normalize. So the vector like masses of the various, you know, fermions, they could be different from each other by another one amount. Uh, they don't have to be the same. Let me normalize this to sort of 90 TB. Uh, for a reason, uh, and so in this case, you know, the rough prediction of the electron EDM would be 10 to the minus 29 E times centimeter, and 10 to the minus 29 is exactly the current experimental bound on the, on the electron EDM, okay? So I've normalized this, this vector-like mass uh, for that purpose, which is to say that, indeed, you know, not only in these types of solutions to astroscopy with, with this additional structure, uh, again, precision measurements looking to improve on the electron EDM, which is also something that is gonna happen, uh, in the next few years are also, you know, exceedingly interesting probes of, of this type of physics. Yeah, and this, you know, this bound is exactly the current bound from the ACME collaboration. And I think various other uh, collaborations are going, to, are going to also improve on this. Um, Okay, yeah, so basically, uh, you know, radiatively, these models can still be good solutions to the strong CP problem uh, with the additional, you know, statement that there are things to watch out for uh, in, future, in future, you know, precision, precision experiments. Okay, so let me now go on to uh, estimate what, what the effect of breaking by, by gravitational interactions would do to, this, to these models. Just to be fair and, and do a fair comparison with the QCD axiom that we were discussing yesterday. Are there any questions so far? Uh, okay. Yeah, so we should ask the same question. Uh, how robust are P solutions to breaking by parameter operators? And so So the leading, so basically the lowest order higher dimensional operator uh, we can write down that violates parity is a dimension five operator. And it turns out is a dimension five operator that involves uh, the quark sector, okay? So I'm gonna write this down for you. I'm gonna, yeah, so it would be, let me just say it's M Planck suppressed. So this is an operator that involves, you know, there will be some couplings here with flavor indices. Okay. 
plus Hermitian conjugate. Okay. So this is dimension five operators. Uh, these guys are, you know, some dimensionless coefficients. If if this matrix is Hermitian, then this would actually be a parity preserving. Uh, this would be parity preserving. So provided these guys are non-Hermitian, then this would be the leading higher dimensional operator that uh, that breaks this generalized parity. So once the Higgses get their vacuum expectation value, uh, this first term here leads in particular to an additional contribution to the up quark mass that parametrically uh, is basically given by you know, the one one component of this matrix, B, B prime suppressed by twice and Planck. Uh, and similarly, For, for the down quark. And then we can estimate how that, how that will contribute to R of the term and therefore to, to theta bar. So so that would pick up the imaginary part of this contribution uh, overall relative to the overall size of the, of the up quark mass and the same for the down sector. Um, and you see, again, the value of the Yukawa coupling for the up quark, which is 10 to the 5, 10 to the minus 5, sorry. We can write this down as parametrically something like this. Okay, where mod alpha here just refers to the you know, typical overall size of the entries in this matrix in some general way. So we obviously want this thing to be remain smaller than 10 to the minus 10 for this not to completely destroy our nice solution to the strong CP problem. And if we turn this around, as a, it actually this turns around uh, as an upper bound on how large the priority breaking scale can be. So remember, you know, experimental constraints from LHC gives us uh, a lower bound on V prime. V prime needs to be bigger than something for these extra particles to be heavy enough. These guys, this is now giving us uh, an upper bound on how large uh, V prime can be. And it turns out that that upper bound is 20 TeV, okay, for order one values of these, of these, you know, generic mass matrix. Uh, when say, yeah, when theta bar is, we force it to be smaller than 10 to the minus 10, okay. So notice, like 20 TeV is actually very close to the current uh, lower bound on B prime, which is 18 TeV, uh, which is kind of funny. So, but notice in particular that, you know, we are taking the leading dimension five higher dimensional operator. Assuming these coefficients are order one, so we're not making any special assumptions, and we're still good, okay? By comparison with the QCD action yesterday, when we computed uh, how small the overall coefficient of the leading dimension five operator had to be, we found that that thing had to be smaller than 10 to the minus 55. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of, uh, that gives you some measure of like, you know, the robustness of these different, uh, of these different solutions to, to, the, to the strong CP problem. So, I guess you can infer after all of this, like, uh, you know, what my favorite is. But you can make, we can make your own mind. Um, this one, you were also like adding like a bunch of new H prime, H prime. You are adding uh, new field content. Uh, so that is one criticism. That is one criticism you can make. Um, you know, in the in the QCD axiom, you know, the story by itself seems very minimal, right? All you've done is ask the pseudo-scaler. Once you realize you have a quality problem and you have to solve that quality problem, you know, the additional field content and shenanigans you have to do to solve that problem, it is actually not that different from, you know, a more extended structure that, that we are discussing here, okay? And I feel like in some ways it's a lot more ad hoc. Uh, so let me sort of perhaps just recap what well, I think some of the, you know, some of the, some of the lessons of this discussion are before, before we change to something else. So, so far, I would say the bottom line
basically, all of the structural puzzles we have uh, in the standard model are related to how symmetries are broken and sometimes and sometimes no broken, like in the strong CP case. Uh, so insights into how symmetries are realized in the UV uh, can provide uh, new perspectives to, to some of these problems. So for example, you know, adding a bunch of additional fill content to solve the strong CP problem can seem ad hoc. However, again, if you think of P and or CP, as arising from some higher dimensional structure that would render these guys actually discrete, discrete space time symmetries that are gauge, then there is no way for you to break parity and CP explicitly. Okay? So the fact that you know, in this context, these symmetries would have to be broken only spontaneously forces you to consider uh, extensions of the standard model along these lines. And you know, I've written for you the absolutely minimal extension of the standard model that is consistent with parity being a spontaneously broken symmetry. So I think understanding more, uh, you know, to what extent we should think of discrete space-time symmetries of the standard model as gate symmetries in a UV completion is an exceedingly interesting uh, direction. Again, some of, you know, some people like Michael Dine or like Dan Harlow would tell you like for sure these are gate symmetries. Uh, you know, some other people are a bit more agnostic. Uh, people have also recently, you know, started thinking about the implications uh, in cosmology of what having CP or P be a gate symmetry would be. Uh, these are all like extremely interesting questions that would, you know, that would give a sort of perspective uh, as to how to go about, you know, practical problems of the standard model like this one. Okay. Um, yeah, and hopefully, you know, this this uh, this cool this title aspects of symmetry, inspired by the many you know, new developments in our understanding of symmetry structures in recent times. So will new developments on our understanding of symmetry bring some new ideas or maybe new perspective into some of these, into some of these otherwise you know, fairly old puzzles? Hopefully they will. Uh -huh. yeah, I'm optimistic they will. And on that note, uh, I'm going to remind you of something that is now quite an old story. And yeah, of course. What would be the experimental, uh, I guess, evidence of the breaking by these high-dimensional operators using gravitational waves? Or? I mean, to lead in order, you can say, you know, a theta bar that is kind of like of this size, you know, a little bit below 10 to the minus 10. Um, you know, you can put constraints, like if we don't observe, you know, theta bar to be 10 to the minus 11, you know, in the next couple of years, you know, it gives you some idea of like how suppressed these operators have to be. Uh, unfortunately, like beyond that, I don't think you can make any, you know, there are no sort of like smoking gun signatures. It's more something about like the robustness of these, of these constructions, I guess, breaking by, by gravity. Um, I mean, there are some experimental consequences of you know, explicit breaking by gravity uh, of discrete symmetries in the context of cosmology. Uh, and I will, we are gonna actually discuss that like tomorrow a little bit more. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that would be, I mean, there are some examples of how that can happen, but in general, you know, in general it's kind of hard. Yeah. Um, yeah, so let me sort of very quickly remind you, sort of trying to stimulate perhaps some thoughts on, on my last point here. Uh, let me remind you about an older story uh, which some of you may have heard about, which goes by the name of the massless up quark solution to, to the strong CP problem. Uh, so let's see. So this is uh, this idea is the obvious statement that if the determinant of the quark mass matrix is zero, 
then the argument of the determinant is obviously physical, it's ill defined. Uh, so, arg that m is ill defined, and this renders theta bar unphysical. Okay, we can rotate it to any value we want, which is to say that it actually drops out of any, you know, any physical sort of observable that you that you try to compute. So, and, you know, for a long time, people thought, well, for example, if the up quark mass uh, was zero, being the lightest one for a while, you know, this was actually experimentally a possibility, then, uh, you know, this will kind of solve the strong CP in this way. So, this was possible for a long time. Uh, let me say any words. Uh, but now it is ruled out, okay? Um, so, people would say the following things previously, which is that, well, you set M up to be zero, then theta bar is unphysical, you're solving a strong CP, but it was kind of bothersome because, you know, there's no symmetry that actually gets restored when you take a fermion mass to zero, right? Classically, we say that the u one chiral symmetry is not a good symmetry, that's true at the classical level, but the fact that uh, the u one chiral symmetry is anomalous means that there is no actual, you know, honest symmetry that is restored in this limit. So what is going on uh, with this, with these solutions? Uh, Nowadays, maybe, you know, people could say a non-invertible symmetry is actually restored in the, uh, in the limit of, in the limit of zero, zero fermion mass. Uh, so maybe, you know, one actually should have been thinking about the massless apart solution all along as a symmetry-based solution, if we had known about non-invertible symmetries earlier. I'm sort of a little bit, I think it's a little bit harder to kind of, you know, it's not clear whether you can actually make that statement. Uh, and I say that for the following reason, which is that, you know, the mass, the mass of, the, of a fermion, uh, in particular the upwork mass, uh, is, is a quantity that depends on, on what a scale uh, you're looking, you're looking at your system. So if you set the mass of your, say, you know, the, the mass of your up quark to be zero in, say, like, you know, the boundary conditions of your UV theory, nevertheless, in the infrared, there is going to be corrections uh, to this expression, okay? And so in the infrared, you do actually generate a mass, an effective mass for the for the quark, even, even if the, the sort of leading UV correction is, is zero, uh, and that comes, is of the form of like, you know, some overall coefficient, and then something that goes like MD, MS divided by the, the scale of sort of QCD, QCD confinement. So this is, this is, notice this is not a sort of multiplicative renormalization of the Fermi mass, it's an additive renormalization. Um, this, is zero at all orders in perturbation theory, but non-perturbatively, this is there. Uh, and the fact that this is non-zero was the reason that, you know, for a long time, having, you know, the, the massless up core solution was actually a valid solution, because at low energies, uh, you know, the spectrum of hadrons can mimic, so, you know, this, this additional operator can mimic a non-zero up quark mass. Uh, so for a long time, this was entirely consistent with, with lattice data. It's not anymore. Uh, which is why we don't talk about this, uh, but I think it's nevertheless interesting to kind of revisit uh, this, you know, how this solution would have worked uh, in light of, you know, our new understanding of non-invertible symmetries in the limit of massless fermions and understand, you know, how you could have guessed, uh, you know, some contribution like this based on the symmetry structure. Uh, and maybe that will give us some clues as to, you know, other, other solutions to, to a strong CP. Related to that, uh, and this is absolutely my last comment about strong CP. Okay, so related to that, uh, let me make an obvious, an obvious observation. 
which says that certainly if one of the eigenvalues of the, uh, of the quark mass matrix is zero, then R of the time is zero, but we don't actually need to go all the way there. So the, arg the argument of the determinant of the quark mass matrix is also zero if for some crazy reason, the quark mass matrix and therefore the Yukawa couplings in the standard model happen to be Hermitian, okay? Now, there's no symmetry that is recovered by, you know, demanding that the San Yukawa coupling in the standard model is Hermitian, uh, but uh, <laughs> notice that having Hermitian, Hermitian Yukawa couplings uh, is entirely consistent with, it's entirely, okay, with having a CKM phase that is sort of the one, okay? So there's still a complex, you know, part in these matrices that doesn't have to be small. So we can still get a large CKM phase, but somehow the argument of the determinant of this guy is of the contribution to zero bar will vanish. Uh, and this comes down to the fact that, so we've already seen that, you know, in the, in a strong violation of P and CP, from the, from the quark sector can be parameterized as, you know, it's proportional to the argument of the determinant of these guys, way up, way down, but it's not actually hard to see that weak CP violation, and in particular the phase, uh, the phase of the CKA matrix, is actually proportional to the argument of the determinant of the commutator of the Yukawa couplings, okay? So if these guys were Hermitian, this would be zero, but this whole thing would be anti-Hermitian, so you can still get a large phase out of this. Um, so, you know, these are interesting observations that sometimes make me feel like there is something we don't understand about the flavor sector of the standard model, and like, if we did, you know, this could perhaps solve the strong CP problem. Unfortunately, you know, I don't have, you know, any really good ideas about it, uh, but, you know, let me emphasize that the whole kind of starting point of the strong CP problem was that, you know, we start with some Yukawa matrices that are general matrices that are three by three. So we're imagining from the get-go that, you know, something from above, like the UV theory, is giving us these matrices. In other words, you know, we're imagining there is some theory of flavor that generates these parameters for us. Uh, and, you know, it is in that context that we can then sort of make this inference about what we expect uh, as to the natural size of, of theta bar in the standard model. So I think, you know, my bias is that new ideas to understand the flavor structure of the standard model uh, related maybe to some of these developments in symmetry uh, could really tell us something, something, you know, could really generate some, some new solutions to a strong CP that we haven't, that we haven't discovered yet. So, so that's all I'm going to say about, about strong CP. I wish I had like more concrete ideas. Uh, along these lines, but I don't know, maybe this will, you know, spark some, some thoughts. Uh, okay, so that's all I want to say about, you know, a strong CP kind of per se. We're gonna switch off to discuss um, what happens to the spectrum of, so, you know, we've discussed, we've seen that not only for the standard model, but also extensions of the standard models geared to solving a lot of the, the, the problems we have in the standard model, not only symmetry is crucial, but also spontaneous symmetry breaking is crucial, right? Like for the QCD action, you know, it's important that the U1PQ symmetry is spontaneously broken. That gives us a pseudo number Goldstone boson with action. In disparity solutions, parity has to be a spontaneously broken symmetry to be consistent with the experiment. Uh, so not only symmetry, but a spontaneous symmetry breaking is, you know, an essential ingredient, not just in the standard model, but also beyond. And uh, it turns out that the spectrum of theories, uh, the spectrum of theories featured in the spontaneous symmetry breaking is beyond perturbation theory can actually be extremely interesting uh, and lead to, you know, to fairly spectacular sort of phenomenological and, and experimental, uh, con you know, consequences. So that's kind of the next topic that we're going to discuss, kind of motivated by our discussion so far, is spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, beyond beyond perturbation theory. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Okay. 
So, is that one new topic? So, I mean, the discussion here obviously is a lot more general. We'll sort of keep in mind a little bit, you know, the, the sort of types of theories we've discussed so far, like the QCD action and the parity solutions. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna keep it. We're gonna keep it more general. So, um, yeah. So basically, uh, for the rest of this lecture, and probably a little bit for the first lecture tomorrow, um, we'll. The, the goal is to see that. Theories with some, you know, spontaneous symmetry breaking structure uh, can have a recess spectrum beyond uh, perturbation theory. And this is the case uh, if they host of, or they contain what we sometimes call uh, solitons or defects. And we're going to discuss two cases. Uh, for example, the case of domain walls and also cosmic strings. Uh, not accidentally, these are two types of defects that the theories we discussed so far, both the QCD axiom and the parity solutions, uh, both contain. Okay, and in many cases, uh, they they can provide some of the some very interesting sort of uh, experimental experimental constraints. Uh, and then what we do sort of afterwards. I, I want to see in the next lecture because I'm I'm going so much slower than I was planning. Uh, we'll discuss. The cosmological implications of those defects and how you know that can actually tell us you know put interesting experimental constraints on, on some of these models. So, very loosely speaking, uh, just for everyone to be on the same page, I'm going to define for you what I mean by a soliton in these lectures. Uh, so, what I'm going to mean is that these are Static solutions to the equations of motion that nevertheless have finite energy. But crucially, they are different from the vacuum, okay? And they cannot be continuously deformed to the to a vacuum solution. So this is sort of like a loose uh, definition. Uh, you know, often a lot of you may be familiar with like, you know, topological defects. Uh, you know, in some cases, you know, the solitons can be topologically stable defects, uh, but they don't have to be. In fact, many of the phenomenological implications of these types of, you know, soliton extended objects can actually be, you know, extremely interesting, even if they are not topologically stable. In many cases, even if they are not energetically stable. So that's kind of not really going to be a big, a big consideration in our discussion. So let me start by something I think a subset of you probably already know, but I'll sort of do a quick review, which are uh, domain walls. So, um, loosely speaking, uh, these are two-dimensional solitons. So, in 3D, so in 3 plus, you know, a theory that is 3 plus 1 dimensions, these are localized along one of the spatial dimensions. Uh, and they generically arise in the spontaneous symmetry breaking of discrete symmetries, okay? For example, a spontaneous symmetry breaking of a parity symmetry, uh, if that was spontaneously broken. So the simplest example of uh, a theory that contains this type of solitons uh, is a theory that has a global C 
symmetry. Uh, so let me write that down as yes, there's some real scalar field with some potential that has a minimum at non-zero, non-zero phi, okay? So under the C2, uh, you know, phi goes to minus phi, and this whole thing is invariant. You know, the Yes, thanks. Uh, yeah, so the potential I've, I've written there has this form. Okay, there are two, there are two exactly the generative aqua at plus V and minus V, uh, but they are related by, by this global C2 transformation. So, so yeah, dV d phi is zero, and then the vacuum would be, the theory would have to choose between, you know, minus V or plus V. And then at the, at the perturbative level, so the perturbative spectrum, which will be identical around any of those two uh, minima, will be a massive scalar field uh, with mass, which is a further you know, root lambda times the scale of, of a spontaneous symmetry breaking. Hopefully, you know, this is all something you've seen a ton of times. Uh, so let's see what happens uh, beyond perturbation theory. So, uh, so the name of the game is, can we find solutions to the equations of motion which are you know, time independent? Uh, there are not the vacuum, and that we cannot continuously deform to the vacuum, uh, but that nevertheless have, have finite energy. So let's see how we do this. Uh, so let us write down the energy of what would be the energy of a static field configuration uh, localized along. along one of the spatial dimensions, okay? And W log, I'm just gonna take that to be the C direction, so I'm gonna assume that phi is only a function of C. Uh, so, okay, in general, the energy just contains a contribution which is the gradient part for the field, and then also just the potential term. Okay, because I'm considering uh, a field configuration that is localized only along the C direction, I can actually do the integral over x and y, and what I get is the area of the xy plane. Uh, and then I still have to integrate over all of, uh, all of the C direction. Plus, be of phi. So for a sort of for a finite area of this object, uh, having finite e requires requires that for one uh, this guy goes to zero as uh, z goes to plus minus infinity. So which is the same as saying like phi. Well, phi has to be phi has to go to either plus or minus v as c goes to plus or, or minus infinity, right? So that gives us four options for how that can happen. So there are four options. So let me just sort of draw what those can be. So this could be phi as a function of c. And here will be plus v. 
here will be minus b. So and at infinity, you know, the field has to be either in in one of these uh, in one of these along one of these lines. Uh, we could have phi goes to plus b both uh, plus infinity and minus infinity, and maybe here in the middle, you know, we do something crazy, but. This is a field configuration that we can obviously uh, continuously deform to the vacuum solution, uh, which could be sort of, you know, the configuration with the least energy uh, with those boundary conditions at infinity, correct? The same is true, you know, if we consider something that uh, goes to minus v at plus and minus infinity, we can always continuously deform it to the, to the vacuum. Now, the case uh, that is non-trivial is when we have you know, phi going to say plus v at plus infinity and minus v at, at minus infinity, okay? Uh, obviously, for this to happen, there needs to be some region where phi passes by, in particular, uh, phi equals zero. So the field is going to be at the minimum of its potential here, it's going to be at the minimum of its potential asymptotically here, and then there, there's going to be some some region uh, or some, some length, let me call it capital L, where uh, you know, energy density is localized because the potential doesn't vanish in this, in this region. And notice this is a field configuration that crucially, we cannot deform to, to one of the two vacua while uh, maintaining uh, the energy to be finite, okay? We will have to change the entire value of the field at infinity, uh, and that's not an operation we can do uh, with, with finite energy. Uh, and there's, of course, uh, a similar equivalent solution, which is the case where, you know, we start at plus v at minus infinity, and then we go to, you know, minus v at, uh, at plus infinity, okay? So these are the two, uh, the two possible options that are non-trivial, uh, where the energy is finite, cannot be deformed to the, to the vacuum. So I've drawn this here as a function of the, of the c direction. Of course, if we are in a theory with three spatial directions, um, this actually becomes, so very often, you know, you may have seen this uh, discussed uh, as the kink solution uh, for, for theories with spontaneously broken C2. Uh, if we sort of extend, you know, if we also draw the, the other uh, two spatial directions, uh, this is precisely what we call uh, a domain wall, okay? So this would be sort of uh, a region of uh, energy density localized on on this, on a wall that is, you know, roughly, you know, planar in the x and y directions, and then there is some thickness L in the along the c-axis where like the energy density is localized, uh, and precisely the the energy per unit area, so E over A, uh, that will correspond to uh, the surface tension of the of the domain wall. So. We can find a little bit more about this type of soliton solution without doing a lot of work. So let me do that in the last five minutes. So of course, you know, one thing you can do, in fact, for a potential like that, you can actually solve for the profile of phi on the domain wall solution analytically, and what you find is that phi actually has sort of like a tange solution where you know it stays, goes constant at infinity and then sort of changes uh, you know over some region that is that is finite. But in the spirit of not doing things kind of exactly, you know, not solving equations exactly, let me just estimate. Let's just get an idea of how, like how we would guess you know the features of the solution, which are trying to solve uh, for, this, for this exactly. So we can make an answer already from the picture that I drove there uh, for what this solution would be like as a function of C. And simply that is that, say it has to be minus V for some value of theta or some value of C smaller than, let me call it minus L, and plus V for Z larger than plus L, okay? And then in between, it's going to vary somewhat smoothly. Uh, so with these answers, I can now very roughly estimate what well, the surface tension, let me call it capital sigma. So this is going to be energy per unit area, which is the surface tension of the domain wall. So 
there are various, uh, there are basically two contributions that come to this, which are one is that gradient term. So, you know, the field changes by roughly V over a distance L, and this goes square, and I'm also integrating over C. So that's roughly what we expect from the, from the gradient term. And then from the potential term, we know that in the domain wall, uh, the, the value of phi, you know, is a small, uh, it's not at its minimum, so we can sort of estimate that by putting the potential at roughly, you know, the, the, the typical size, which is the quartic coupling times, you know, the typical scale uh, to the fourth. So, so overall, we get something like V squared on L plus L lambda V to the fourth. Uh, and now we can ask, okay, what is the, you know, what is the thickness of this domain wall that minimizes the surface tension? We just take a derivative, uh, and then we find that the thickness of the domain wall is typically of order root lambda times V, which is, you remember from some previous discussion, this is precisely the quantum wavelength of the scalar particle that uh, the theory has uh, in, its, in its perturbative spectrum. So we can now actually take that value of the thickness and evaluate uh, what the surface tension is. So if we, if we plug this back in, so sigma for L of order the quantum wavelength, uh, we find something which is, I'm gonna get the factors of lambda right, uh, for the root lambda times V cube, okay? So we kind of hand wave that wave around, you know, what the features of this Doliton solution have to be like. Uh, but we basically go right both, you know, the two relevant scales for this problem, which are the thickness of the wall and the, and the domain wall tension. Now, there are two comments that I want to make uh, before I finish which are, so two comments. Uh, number one is notice that, you know, in some sense, what I'm going to call the total mass of a domain wall is so, you know, we could estimate it as the area of the wall times the surface tension that we've computed. Uh, for this entire picture to make sense as an actual sort of, uh, as an actual domain, uh, as an actual domain wall, this area will have to be, you know, at the very least bigger than, you know, the inverse quantum wavelength of, of, our, of our scalar field in both x and y directions. Uh, so, so this is an absolute sort of like lower bound on the overall mass of this object. And putting in numbers, uh, notice this goes like V over root lambda, okay? So notice that, you know, unlike the perturbative spectrum where, you know, the mass of our particle is always proportional to the coupling, uh, as we take lambda perturbative, uh, so, you know, if we take lambda very tiny, the mass of this object just gets bigger and bigger. Um, another comment I want to make is that, so, you know, this is well below sort of the, you know, the low energy regime uh, of, the, of the theory. Uh, more, perhaps more relevant is that we can also estimate uh, what the total number of phi quanta there are in, in one of these kind of domain walls, okay? So, let me compare, uh, let me call that N, and let me, let me sort of define, as, define, define that as sort of the mass of this object, extended object, relative to the mass of, of one of the phi particles. So again, you know, the domain wall has to have area which is, you know, bigger than uh, quantum wavelength square, so, and that is an absolute upper, uh, lower bound. And this happens to scale at the very least as one over lambda, okay? And this is very, very large. So this is the same, so this is to say that, you know, this is sort of like an object of large occupation number. Okay, the fluctuations in the number of quanta
we can estimate as fluctuations, you know, will be of order root n over n, so one over root n. So that gives us something of order root lambda itself. Okay, which is which is small for for a small lambda. And this is the entire reason that even though these are these are objects sort of like beyond perturbation theory, the fact that you know the number of fluctu that that you know the fluctuations are sort of like small in the perturbative limit, this is precisely what allows us to you know to have sort of like a semi-classical description of these of these objects as a small coupling. Okay. So I'm gonna stop here for today. Uh, tomorrow we are going to start discussing uh, a close cousin of domain walls, which are cosmic strings, and which arise in theories with a spontaneous symmetry breaking of uh, continuous symmetries. In particular, we'll focus on the on the U1 case. Um, related to your question, uh, as we go forward, uh, one of the things we're going to discuss later on is that the cosmological implications of, of domain walls. So theories like, for example, uh, the parity the parity theories we we're discussing earlier, where parity is spontaneously broken symmetry, will feature domain walls. And one of the things that we are going to discuss tomorrow is that there are very strong constraints uh, from, in particular, precision CMB measurements that tell us that if there was ever some spontaneous breaking of a discrete symmetry in our universe, there can be not a single domain wall left over, okay? Unless the energy, the typical energy is extremely small. So that puts a very strong constraints on, on theories like this. Uh, higher dimensional operators suppressed by the Planck scale can actually destabilize those domain walls in a way that can lead to very interesting gravitational wave signals. So that's kind of like, you know, where all of this is going to, is going to go tomorrow. We'll discuss, you know, cosmic strings and then we'll try to, you know, quickly uh, connect this to, to phenomenology and sort of like some experimental uh, implications. So that's it for today. Parity break the domain, domain walls are related to this parity breaking. Right? Yes. Uh, is, is it related to the fact that on the right we have like a vacuum with plus v, and on the left we yes. have a vacuum with minus v? Yeah, that's right. So yeah, I'll discuss I'll discuss has like this a little bit more in the context of parity. Okay. Can I check with you? Yes. Ibu said to me something about you switching the order of your lectures tomorrow. Did he talk to you about? Yeah, that I think also? he said he wanted to do not the very last one tomorrow evening. Right. I don't mind. I yeah. prefer to do the 9 a.m. if that's possible because, I don't know, mornings are my thing. Yeah, the, the schedule's better here. Okay. Yeah, a second. Yeah. So, okay, so right now it's, it's you and him and you and him. Yeah. So I think what, what he said, I should check with him, was that he just wanted to switch all of them and make it him and you and him and you. But maybe we could also, if you'd rather be 9. I think I'd rather, yeah, I think what he wanted to do is like leave not too late. Right. So I think what he really cares about is switching this switching one. these. And I'm happy with that, yeah. So, so you, mind, you, yeah. You, your preference would be to do you, him, and him, and you. I think so, yeah. Okay, let's. I'll double check with him. I, I, don't, I just don't want now. to do like two afternoons in particular. Okay. Like it's yeah. Because I guess the uh, I, I I think he had suggested maybe him and then you and then him and then you. I mean that's also just, fine, but yes, yeah, he he lives okay. at the same time, so I feel like that doesn't. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's just uh, let's double check. With Hopefully him, yeah. he'll be. Will you be around for the afternoon sessions? Today? I think I'm, I need to do some restructuring of my lectures because I'm going much slower than okay. I was right. planning. No, I understand. So I may not be around, uh, but I, I mean I'm going to be around. Well, now. I could also just send an email to both of you just to okay, make sure, sure, we, sure we coordinate it. Just copy me. I'll, I'll change the actual calendar. Of the okay. Calendar. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Sounds okay. good. Thanks. Yes. When I was studying the Bruce, I also have this question that whether we should consider that we have different vacuum on the right and light, or it is the same vacuum but like with different, like because of the general the vacuum is plus or minus, it has the same energy. Yes. So, so with the, if the symmetry is a global symmetry, then these are two different vacua related by a global even symmetry. Though, even though they have like the same. Right? Even though, yeah. So it's not. But if the symmetry was a gauge symmetry, so it's not like. It's different. It's not the general vacuum. 
they are degenerating energy, but they are, you know, physically different states, so like, related by, by symmetry. <laughs> in the symmetry, 